Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Now, here's Eddie coming out of the Oxford groups. He is on fire with this simple religious idea the power greater than human power. God is the understood him or whatever. Bill's drunk. Been drunk now for about three weeks. Hung over, not feeling good. Abby was going to drink with him. Bill thought, and Abby won't drink with him, and Bill's disappointed by that. And they're sitting there talking about God. You know how we are when we get into those kind of conversations. Abby was saying one thing, and Bill was arguing with him or something else, and don't tell me about God. Oh, yeah, I could go some, some, some creation, ta, 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 and on and on and on. And I guess Abby finally got tired of it. Let's look at the next statement very, very carefully. My friend suggested what then seemed a novel idea. He said, and notice this is a squiggly writing. That's italic. He said, why don't you choose your own conception of God? And the instant he said that, his message changed from a religious message to a spiritual message. Religion says this is the way you have to believe, whatever that particular religion might be. Spirituality says it really doesn't make any difference how you believe. The only question is, are you willing to believe? Why don't you choose your own conception of God? And that little statement has opened the door for literally millions and millions of we alcoholics to be able to find a power greater than human power. I don't think Abby said that out of any wisdom on his part. I think he told that to Bill out of sheer frustration. He said, all hell, Bill, and believe whatever you want to. You know, that's the way Bill heard it. But it's like Charlie said, that, that statement opened up the door for literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of us alcoholics. Why don't you choose your own conception of God? Now, here is the effect it had on Bill. He said, that statement hit me hard. It melted the icy intellectual mountain whose shadow I'd lived and shivered many years. I stood in the sunlight at last. What it did, it took away all argument from him. It was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required of me to make my beginning. <clears throat> I saw that growth could start from that point. Upon a foundation of complete willingness, I might build what I saw in my friend, what I have it, of course I would. You know, the reason I think that works so good for us, why don't you choose your own conception of God? The reason it works so good for we alcoholics is we've never had any problem with our own conception of anything. <laughs> you bet you let us be the way we want to believe, and we're ready to go, aren't we? Yeah, yeah that's why it works for people like us. Just that my idea has got to be great. I mean, surely... And he said, I saw that growth could start from that point upon a foundation of complete willingness I might build what I saw in my friend. Now, this is Bill's first reference to a wonderfully effective spiritual structure. And, and as we go through the book, he's going to paint a picture in our mind. And then he's eventually going to tell us what this spiritual structure is. He's going to tell us it's going to be an arch through which we're going to pass to freedom. And as we progress through each step, he will refer to this. Willingness is the foundation of that wonderfully effective spiritual structure. That's step one. Believing is the cornerstone of that wonderfully effective spiritual structure. So Bill has already taken step one and step two. You know, when, we, when we've had all we can stand, when we've had all the drinking we can put up with, when we can see that what we're trying to do is not going to work for us any longer and we become willing to give up, then that's step one and that's the foundation for recovery. Then step two will be believing. As we go on through the book, we're going to see more and more references to this wonderfully effective spiritual structure, Joe. And you see, that's what I convinced that God is concerned with us humans is when we want him enough. At long last, I saw, I felt, I believed. Scales of pride and prejudice, old ideas, fell from my eyes. A new world came into view. The real significance of my experience in the cathedral burst upon me. For a brief moment I had needed and wanted God. There had been a humble willingness to have him with me 
and he came. But soon the sense of his presence had been blotted out by worldly clamors, mostly those within ourselves. Bill was pretty sick, and Abby thought that maybe Bill ought to go back in the hospital one more time and get sobered up because he was really, really sick. And this was the third time, about December the 10th to 11th, 1934. And he said, at the hospital, I was separated from alcohol for the last time. Treatment seemed wise, so I showed signs of delirium tremens. Okay, we've seen Bill take step one and two. Now let's look on page 13, and let's see if we can't really see the last ten steps of Alcoholics Anonymous after he was withdrawn from alcohol by Dr. Silkworth for the third time. Abby comes to visit with him in the hospital. They begin to apply the Oxford Group Program of Action in Bill's life. And let's see if we can see how that later became the last ten steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, There I humbly offer myself to God as I then understood him, to do with me as he would. I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing. Without him I was lost. The first step in the Oxford Group program was surrender. And Bill knew that no self-respecting alcoholic would ever want to surrender to anything. So he changed that to make a decision. We see him here taking what we know today as step three, which was there, step one. He says, I ruthlessly faced my sins. They, their next uh, step in their program of action was examine your sins. And Bill knew no self-respecting alcoholic is going to do that. So he changed that to make a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. There we see him taking what we know today to step forward. And became willing to have my newfound friend take them away root and branch. I've not had a drink since. Became willing to have my newfound friend take them away root and branch. If you'll notice that friend is capitalized, he's referring to God. And that little statement later became steps six and seven, where we became willing to have God remove these things and in seven humbly ask him to do so. So there he's dealing with six and seven. My schoolmate visited me, and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. Their next step in their program of action was confession and sharing. And he knew no alcoholic could want to confess to anything. So he made that into admitted to God, to ourselves and another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. There he's dealing with step five. We made a list of people I'd heard and toward whom I felt resentment. I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals admitting my wrong. Never was I to be critical of them. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability. They had a step called restitution. And oh, the alcoholics didn't like that word restitution. So later on, Bill changed that and made two steps out of it, steps eight and nine. So I was there we did him see him dealing with eight and nine. I was to test my thinking by the new God conscious within. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. That became later became step ten where we continue to take personal inventory, so on and so forth. As I would sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Never was I to pray for myself, except as my request bore on my usefulness to others. Then only might I expect to receive, but that would be in great measure. There is all the elements of step 11, where we sought through prayer and meditation, so on, so on, and so forth. There we're dealing with step 11. My friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my Creator that I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems. Got to be the first part of step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. So we, we see Bill in the town hospital applying the Oxford Group program, which later turned out to be the last 10 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is how he was able to say four years later when he wrote How It Works, these are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. Bill took them in the town's hospital. Now look at this. See the results of that. Joe has made a decision. He's getting ready to take some action. Real. <laughs> he said, my friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my Creator that I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems, belief in the power of God, 
plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things with the essential requirements. Simple, but not easy. A price had to be paid. It meant destruction of self-centeredness. I must turn in all things to the Father of Light who presides over us all. Poor alcoholic, in order for us to recover, we have to give up the two things we hold nearest and dearest to our heart. The first one is alcohol. The second one is self-centeredness. Very, very simple requirements, but sometimes extremely hard to do. Now, here's the effect that this had on Bill. He said these were revolutionary and drastic proposals. At the moment I fully accepted them, the effect was electric. There was a sense of victory followed by such a peace and serenity as I'd never known. There was utter confidence. I felt lifted up as though the great clean wind of a mountaintop blew through and through. God comes to most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. Bill thought he was going crazy. He said, for a moment I was alarmed and called my friend the doctor to ask if I were still sane. And he listened in wonder as I talked. Finally, he shook his head saying, something has happened to you I don't understand. But you better hang on to it. Anything is better than the way you were. Now, we don't know what happened to Bill that day. No, we were not there to see that. But we do know this. This was probably about December the 14th of 1934. Bill didn't die until January of 1971. It was never necessary for him to take another drink as long as he lived. He always said that he had a vital spiritual experience as the result of these steps that he took in the town hospital. Something profound took place in his life that day. Old ideas were cast aside, replaced with a new set of ideas. And he was able to live the rest of his life with enough peace of mind, serenity, and happiness. They didn't have to drink anymore. Just think, when this guy went in there now, the great drive for success was on. The majority of his life, he did less like the rest of us. He tried to prove to the world that he's important, just as good as they are. The great drive to be somebody, to show the rest of the world that he's just as good as anybody else. The great drive to make money was on. He comes out of the town's hospital. Now let's look at him and see what he has to say. He said, while I lay in the hospital, the thought came that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have what had been so freely given me. Perhaps I could help some of them. They, in turn, might work with others. My friend, and this time it's a little F, he's referring to Ebby. <clears throat> My friend had em emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating these principles in all my affairs. Particularly was it imperative to work with others as he had worked with me. Faith without works was dead, he said, and how appallingly true for the alcoholic. For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If he did not work, he would surely drink again, and if he drank, he would surely die. Then faith would be dead indeed. And with us, it is just like that. See, my wife and I abandoned ourselves with enthusiasm to the idea of helping other alcoholics to a solution to their problems. It was fortunate for, for my old business associates to remain skeptical for a year and a half, during which I found little work. I was not too well at the time and was plagued by ways of self-pity and resentment. This sometimes nearly drove me back to drink. But I soon found when all other spiritual, when all other measures failed, excuse me, work with another alcoholic would save the day. Many times I've gone to my old hospital in despair. On talking to a man there, I'd be amazingly lifted up and set on my feet. It's a design for living that works in rough going. The work is really, really hard, but the pay is really good, too. <laughs> he used to say sober. You know, thank God. Thank God that when Bill was in Akron, the business venture had fallen through. And he was so low and so down and so depressed. 
that he wanted to go in the bar and have a drink so he could be with people of his kind and feel better. Thank God he remembered how back in New York City in the preceding six months now, even though he had never been able to help anybody else every time he had tried, he himself had felt better. Work with another alcoholic could save the day. That's why he called Dr. Bob. He didn't call Dr. Bob to sober up Dr. Bob. He called Dr. Bob to keep Bill from getting drunk. Thank God it worked for Bill. And thank God Dr. Bob got sober. And we've got Alcoholics Anonymous today. And I think it's just as valid today as it was then. You know, I've been sober for quite some time. There's times that I get down, too. There's times that I get through. There's times that I don't feel good. Times that I get angry, and etc. But I find that if I'll just go find me another drunk, just call one of them on the phone. Just try to help another alcoholic. Immediately I feel better. It has never, never failed me up until this point. I don't think it ever will. I'm also convinced that if I don't do that, if I don't try to share this with others, if I don't try to give away what I've got, eventually I'll end up getting drunk, just like Bill was about to do there in Akron, Ohio. You know? Okay, now let's go to, to uh, page 17. Abby presented Bill with a solution, and now Bill is going to pre present us with a solution. And the chapter heading says there is a solution. An old friend used to be way back home. He's dead now, but he, he said there's as many different solutions as there are people in AA. I said, Harold, if you'll read the chapter heading on uh, chapter 2, it'll tell you how many solutions there are. There is a solution, one. Two different powers but one solution. He said, We of Alcoholics Anonymous know thousands of men and women who were just as hopeless as Bill. Nearly all have recovered. They have solved the drink problem. He said, We are average Americans. Today I say we are average citizens of the world. In my last recollection is 154 countries around the world that have AA in it. So we're average citizens of the world today. All sections of this country and many of its occupations are represented as well as many political, economic, social, and religious backgrounds. We are people who normally would not mix. But there exists among us a fellowship and friendliness and an understanding which is indescribably wonderful. We are people who normally would not mix. As we look around the rooms here today, I can say that we are people who normally would not mix. We're probably the most mixed up group of people in Sacramento tonight. But there exists among us a friendliness and an understanding which is indescribably wonderful. And you hear it at the breaks and the, before the meeting, the laughing, the talking, the joking, the rubbing up against, the hugging and all. That's the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, the spirit of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got sober on that spirit. I had no program. So I came to the fellowship, and I got sober on the fellowship. And the fellowship can help me stay sober a long time. I've seen a lot of people around our area stay sober on the fellowship for years. It is a powerful, powerful thing the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I doubt there's any alcoholic in this room tonight who's going to get drunk tonight because they've been here with the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, the first time this really, really made sense to me was way back in the 1970s. And the other Joe, the Joe from Little Rock, he and I met in 1973. Uh, my wife and I had spoken at an Al-Anon conference and Joe introduced me at that conference in 1973. I never will forget him. He said, you know, I've been looking at this program. We'd never met before. And he said, I've been looking at this program all this time. And I saw the speaker tonight was Charlie P. And I thought it was going to be Charlie Pride. <laughs> and he said, hell, this guy's not even the right damn color. You know? <laughs> and I gave my little talk that night. And, and, and after the... After the talk was over with. We were standing around and talking, and, and Joe said something about the big book Alcoholics Anonymous, and I became real interested. I'd been trying to find somebody up in my neck of the woods, 200 miles from where Joe lives, to talk about the big book, and nobody would talk about it. Joe had been trying to find somebody in Little Rock to talk about the big book. Nobody would talk about it, and we immediately fell in love with each other that night over the big book. And every time we met from then on at an AA convention or any kind of AA function, we would get off in the room and we would show each other what we had learned in the preceding month or two or however long since we'd seen each other, bringing out these new ideas out of the big book. 
Finally, somebody overheard us talking and, and said, uh, you know, would you mind if we sat and listened? And we said, well, no, that'd be all right. And the next time we went somewhere, there was two or three guys sitting in, and then three or four or five or six sitting in. And in a hotel room in Tulsa, Oklahoma, there was 17 of us sitting in a hotel room talking about the big book. And a guy from Lawton, Oklahoma, asked us, he said, would you guys come out to, to, to my group in Lawton and do something with the big book? And we said, hell, we, don't, we, we can't imagine an a, a group wanting to hear about the big book. He said, he said, I... He said, I believe my group would be interested if you guys would come out there. And so we said, okay, we agreed to go. Now, just prior to the time we were supposed to go, I'd had a little heart problem. And we didn't know for sure whether I was going to get to go or not. And I remember Joe called me from Little Rock. And he said, Charlie, what do you think? Said, we going to be able to go out there and do that or not? And I said, well, Joe, we need to go. We've committed ourselves. We need to be there. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, let me drive my car, and I'll come up and get and pick you up. So he goes from, comes from his home in Little Rock up to where I live in Maysville, 200 and some odd miles away. And we get in his car, and we go from my home to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now, there was a third guy that wanted to go with us. And we told him, okay, meet us at the Camelot Hotel parking lot in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we'll all go together. So we picked up the third guy. Now, the third guy happens to be a fellow named Tony. We were driving down the Turner Turnpike from Tulsa, Oklahoma, to toward Oklahoma City, and it suddenly dawned on me what this thing's talking about, were people that normally would not mix. Here we are, three of us in this car. Now, the black guy's doing the driving. Tony, hell, Tony's Mexican. Tony's riding shotgun. And the honkies in the back seat, sound asleep on the way. <laughs> and we got out to Anadarko, the Anadarko Indian Reservation at Lawton, Oklahoma, and the whole front row was filled with Indians from the Anadarko Indian Reservation. Yeah. That time I really understood what this said. And by the way, there's a guy here I'd like for you to meet. His name is Tony. He was with us at the first Big Book study in 1977. Tony, you here? Stand, Stand up, up Tony. Tony. Stand up, Tony. There he is. Yeah, there he is. Look at him. <laughs> Tony, Tony was one of the first to sit in with Charlie and Joe in his room and when they, after they first met. And then in 1974, early 74, I'm walking down the hall of the Compress Hotel, minding my own business. And Tony there said, Joe, would you like to come hear these two guys talk about the big book? And I said, sure. And I got my little friend who was my sponsor at that time, was a little black guy named George. And there was uh, Joe and Charlie and Tony and me and George in that room in 1974 studying the big book together. They were talking, we were listening, asking questions. And that's Tony who saved my life, my sanity. Well, ever since then, I've been a, a student of this big book from that moment on. So we are people who normally would not mix, but even at that, there exists among us a fellowship, a friendliness, and an understanding which is indescribably wonderful. Now, he, he begins to describe this feeling that we have for each other by using an example of something that he assumes we already know about. All good writers do this. They use examples of what you already know to teach you something new. He's talking about we are like the passengers of a great liner. The moment after rescue from shipwreck, when camaraderie, joyousness, and democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to captain's table. Now, back in the 1930s, this is the way people travel from one continent to another on the great ocean liners. Air travel wasn't really hardly in existence in those days. And, and the, the immigrants who came from, from Europe to the United States, most of them didn't have very much money. And they, they, they rode in what they call the steerage section. Now, the steerage section is way down in the bowels of the ship. Now, the accommodations aren't very good. Dormitory-style living, I call it the cheese sandwich section, very little fresh air, but it was cheap. 
Now, if you had more money, you could come up into third class, or you could get up into second class, or you could come on up into first class. Up in first class, you had a nice stateroom. You ate at a nice dining table in a nice dining salon. Everything was really up to snuff. Now, in the journey across the ocean, the person from the steerage section and a person from the first class section should never have met each other. In fact, they even had separate stairwells, so they didn't run into each other accidentally. And if you were in the first class section, that still wasn't really the elite position. If you had the right kind of money, old, old money, if you had the right religious background, if you had the right ethnic background, you might be asked to dine at the captain's table. Now, man, this is really first class. The best food, the best service, the best everything. Certainly the person dining at the captain's table would never have met the one from the steerage section. But then I'm sure Bill had in mind the Titanic. It was Everybody still remembered that very vividly. And the night the Titanic struck the iceberg, these two guys are standing here at the rail now. The guy from the steerage section had made his way up to the upper deck standing at the rail. Here's the guy from the captain's table standing right there beside of him. The guy from the steerage section's got on his old work overall, his old brogan shoes and etc. The guy from the captain's table is dressed to the nines. He's got on his tuxedo and his tie and his jewelry. These guys should never have met each other, period. They had nothing in common whatsoever with each other until they jumped overboard. And they jumped overboard and their butts hit that cold water. They had something in common. The question becomes immediately, well, how in the hell do we save ourselves? And I doubt if the guy from the captain's table wanted an economic report from the man from the steerage section. They grabbed on to each other. They held on to each other. And those that were rescued, when they got back on another ship, they got back on shore. There was a feeling amongst them which was indescribably wonderful. One of the greatest feelings you can have is when a group of human beings have escaped from a common peril, there is a bond that ties them together. And it is a feeling that is absolutely indescribable. I feel it tonight. I feel it here in this room tonight. This feeling that you and I have for each other as recovering alcoholics, one of the greatest things in the world. But he said, Unlike the feeling of the ship's passengers, however, our joy in escape from disaster does not subside as we go our individual ways. Those guys got back on shore. They got on another ship. And after a while, they looked at each other, and they probably said, well, we, we really don't belong together. And, and the guy from the immigrant section, he went to where he was going. The guy from the captain's table went to where he was going. They probably never met again, period. And they lost that great feeling. But it doesn't subside among we alcoholics. Because you see, our common peril is still here. It's right outside the door, and it waits on us all the time. His name is Alcohol. And it says, George, George, where are you? It's always out there. And this feeling we have for each other is one of the greatest bonds that human beings can have for each other. The feeling of having shared in a common peril is one element in the powerful semen which binds us. But that in itself would never have held us together as we are now joined. And I think what he's saying to me here in this paragraph is this fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, man, it's a great thing. There's a lot of power that people have when they come together who have escaped from a common peril. There's enough power to be able to keep us sober for a period of time. But then he warns us that that in itself would never have held us together as we are now joined. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. Not the news of the fellowship, but the news of the common solution. 
And a little later on, we're going to see where the common solution is the vital spiritual experience which changes us. So we're really talking on this page about two powers. The power of the fellowship that supports us. The power of the vital spiritual experience which changes us. And those two powers added together will be enough to overcome our powerlessness over alcohol. And one of the greatest tragedies I see in the world today, you know, we see lots of tragedies in the world today, but one of the greatest I see is that we people who are members of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, we're spending hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of men and women work hours, trying to attract other alcoholics to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, but we've got thousands upon thousands of alcoholics sitting around in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous dying from untreated alcoholism. And the reason they're dying from untreated alcoholism is nobody's telling them about the common solution. Everybody's saying, just keep coming to meetings and you'll be okay. Everybody's saying, just come to 90 meetings in 90 days, it'll be all right. Everybody keeps saying, just come on in here, we're going to love you, you learn to love yourself. And we're not telling them about the common solution. We're not talking to them about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. We're not taking them with a hand and leading them through the steps so that they can have a spiritual experience or spiritual awakening so that they can recover from alcoholism also. And I think they call that sponsorship. And we're lacking in sponsorship in AA today. We're more fellowship than we are sponsorship. And if we could just tell the newcomer, if every one of us could take the responsibility of telling at least one newcomer, yeah, you need this fellowship. You've got to have it. You're not going to survive without it. But fellowship is not going to bring out recovery from alcoholism. Recovery from alcoholism comes through the changes made through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and having the spiritual experience or the spiritual awakening. Just think, my God, how many people would actually save if we would do that. And that's our job. That's our responsibility. Now, the big book never tells you anything. But what it doesn't back it up and prove it. The first half of this chapter is devoted to proving to you and I why fellowship alone is not sufficient. The last half of this chapter will be devoted to the common solution. So the first thing is, let's look at why Fellowship alone is not sufficient. Let's go to page 20, please. <clears throat> I thought he was going to preach there from that. Thank yeah. God he didn't. Oh, you ought to see me when I really get wound up. His arms get to go this way. Yeah, right. I keep waiting for somebody to say, right on, brother, or hallelujah, or something. <laughs> okay, on page 20 it says, you may already have asked yourself, why it is that all of us became so very ill from drinking. Doubtless you are curious to discover how and why, in the face of expert opinion to the contrary, we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. Now, if you're an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, well, what do I have to do? Well, it's the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically. Remember I said earlier that it's going to tell us precisely, specifically, with clear-cut directions? Well, here's one of those words, specifically. We shall tell you what we've done. Before going into detailed discussion, it may be well to summarize some points as we see them. <clears throat> How many times people have said to us, I can take it or leave it alone. Why can't he? Why don't you drink like a gentleman or quit? That fellow can't handle his liquor. Why don't you try beer and wine and lay off the hard stuff? His willpower must be weak. He could stop if he wanted to. She's such a sweet girl. I should think he'd stop for her sake. The doctor told him that if we ever drank again, it would kill him. But there he is, all lit up again. Now, these are commonplace observational drinkers which we hear all the time. Back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. We see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different from ours. Now, we're going to talk about three different kind of drinkers here. The first one we're going to talk about, these expressions that Joe just read, would refer to them. So, modern drinkers. The so modern drinkers have a little trouble in giving up liquor entirely if they had good reason for it. They can take it or leave it alone. Remember we talked about them before? They, they're the ones that have a couple of drinks and they get a 
slightly tipsy, out of control, beginnings of a nauseous feeling, and alcohol is no big deal for them. If they got any reason at all, they'll just simply either quit drinking or drink to the in a way that they have no trouble with it whatsoever. Those expressions would refer to the moderate drinker. So then we have a certain type of hard drinker. He may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him physically and mentally. And it may even cause him to die a few years before his time. Now, if a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, falling in love, change of environment, or the warnings of a doctor becomes operative, this man can stop or moderate, although he may find it difficult and, a little, and troublesome and may even need a little medical attention. We refer to this guy as the heavy or the hard drinker. They drink like we alcoholics drink, but they're not alcoholic. And if they begin to have trouble with alcohol, if a good enough reason presents itself, they'll do one or two things. They may quit drinking entirely. They do not have the obsession of the mind. They may learn to control and moderate their drinking to where they don't have trouble with it. They do not have the physical allergy. They drink like we alcoholics drink, but if a good enough reason presents itself, they'll either stop or they'll moderate. And you and I see them all the time. They're the ones that said, when I was in the service, I was an alcoholic also. But when I got out of the service, I got married and I went to church and I quit drinking and I don't drink anymore. No, they're not alcoholics. They're heavy or hard drinkers. They're not alcoholics. Those expressions that Joe read would refer to them too. But what about the real alcoholic? That's who we want to talk to. But what about the real alcoholic? He may start off as a moderate drinker. He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. Now, we're going to read a bunch of descriptions of alcoholics here. If you see one here that you can identify with, raise your hand. This first one, at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. That's with me. They talk about crossing over that line into alcoholism. I don't really know what line they were talking about, but I was drunk when I went over it. I know that. <laughs> now here's, here's the fellow who's been puzzling you, especially in his lack of control. He does absurd, incredible, tragic things while drinking. Anybody do that? The real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Anybody like that yeah. in here? Mm -hmm. You betcha. He is seldom mildly intoxicated. He's always more, set, more or less insanely drunk. Anybody like, like that, that in that? here? Oh, yeah. His disposition while drinking resembles his normal nature but little. He may be one of the finest fellows in the world, yet even let him drink for a day, he frequently become disgusting and even dangerously antisocial. Anybody, Anybody like that, that in here? I always get good looking and out of debt. Just like that. <laughs> he said he has a positive genius for getting tied at exactly the wrong moment, particularly when some important decision must be made or engagement kept. Anybody in here get drunk at the wrong times in the wrong places? Almost everybody identifies with this next one. He is often perfectly sensible and well-balanced concerning everything except liquor. There he is right there. <laughs> But in that respect, he is incredibly dishonest and selfish. They often possess his special abilities and skills and aptitudes and have a promising career ahead of him. He uses his gift to build up a bright outlook for his family and himself. Then he pulls the structure down on his head by a sensitive series of sprees. He's a fellow who goes to bed so intoxicated he ought to sleep the clock around. Yet early the next morning, he searches madly for the bodily misplaced the night before. If he can afford it, he may have liquor concealed all over his house to be certain no one gets his entire supply away from him to throw down the waste pipe. My wife and I used to buy a lug of whiskey. That's three-fifths. One to share and one to hide from each other. As matters grow worse, he begins to use a combination of high-powered sedative and liquor to quiet his nerves so he can go to work. Then comes a day when he simply cannot make it and gets drunk all over again. Perhaps he goes to a doctor who gives him morphine or some sedative to wish to taper off. Then he begins to appear at hospitals and treatment center, excuse me, sanitariums. Same thing, we just got a better name for him today. This is by no means a comprehensive picture of the true alcoholic as her behavior patterns vary. But this description should identify him roughly. You know, one thing that's happened here 
recently in the last few years. And if our government has ever spent any money right in the field of alcoholism, it's been in education as to what is alcoholism and what isn't alcoholism. Because of that, a lot of the stigma has been removed from alcoholism. Many, many people are getting to us today before they have to do all these things that identify the real alcoholic. But I'll guarantee you, if you're a real alcoholic, you found yourself in there at least somewhere. You know, I can identify with almost every one of them. One of them fits me, especially if he can afford it. He may have liquor concealed all over his house to be sure no one gets his entire supply away from him. Seven years after I got sober, I sold a 40-acre, 45,000 broiler chicken operation. For years after that, sometimes I would meet the guy that bought it, and sometimes he would wave and he'd say, Hey, Charlie, we have found another one. <laughs> and he's referring to partially empty vodka bottles. They were behind corner posts, they were under rocks, they were in hollow trees, they were falling out of feed bins. Found them all over that place for years and years. I certainly identify. Now here's the question. Why does he behave like this? If hundreds of experiences have shown him that one drink means another debacle with all its attendant suffering and humiliation, why is it that he takes that one drink? Why can't he stay on the water wagon? If the moderate drinker can, the heavy drinker can, why can't the alcoholic? What has become of the common sense and willpower that he still sometimes displays with respect to other matters? Perhaps there never will be a full answer to these questions. Opinions vary considerably as to why the alcoholic reacts differently from normal people. We're not sure why. Once a certain point is reached, a little can be done for him. We cannot answer the riddle. Perhaps there will never be a full answer to these uh, uh, questions. Uh, opinions vary considerably as to why the alcoholic reacts differently from normal people. We're not sure why once a certain point is reached, a little can be done for him. We cannot answer the riddle. We read that, didn't we? Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Caught me thinking that's what happened. And nobody better than do that. Now, we know that while the alcoholic keeps away from drink, as he may do for months or years, he reacts much like other men. We're equally positive that once he takes any alcohol, whatever, into his system, something happens both in the bodily and mental sense. Both in the bodily and mental sense. Which makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. The experience of any alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. Now, these observations, the, the ones, ones we, we just read, yeah, would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink, thereby setting the terrible cycle in motion. Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in the mind rather than in the body. Joe, would you read that statement again, please? Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in the mind rather than in the body. Now, if you ask him why he started upon that last bender, the chances are he will offer you any one of a hundred alibis. Sometimes these excuses have a certain plausibility, but, it, no, but none of them really make sense in the light of the havoc an alcoholic's drink, drinking bout creates. They sound like the philosophy of a man who having a headache beats him on the head with a hammer so that he can't feel the ache. If you draw this fallacious reasoning to the attention of an alcoholic, he will laugh it off or become irritated and refuse to talk. Now, once in a while, he may tell the truth. Strange as it may seem, there are times when we alcoholics tell the truth. Not too often, but once in a great while. You know, I had a woman come to me one time, or she was in Al-Anon, her, her husband was still drinking. She said, Charlie, all he does is lie, lie, lie. She said, how can you tell when one of you guys are lying? I said, well, lady, watch him closely. And if you see his lips moving, he's probably lying to you all right. <laughs> <clears throat> I said, do you want me to tell you how to keep him from lying? And she said, yeah, yeah. And I said, don't ask him those stupid questions. <laughs> he don't know the answer any more than you know the answer. Has no idea why he took that first drink. It's going to true, pay. Oh, true, excuse. strange to say, is usually he has no more idea why you, he took that first drink than you have. Some drinkers have excuses which are a satisfied part of the time, but in their hearts they really do not know why they do it. Once this malady is a real hold, they are a baffled lot. There is the obsession that somehow, someday, they will beat the game. But they often suspect they are down for the count. Now, there's the word obsession. 
And remember, an obsession is an idea that overcomes all ideas to the contrary. An obsession is an idea that is so strong that it can make you believe a lie. And the great obsession of every alcoholic is someday, somehow, we're going to find some kind of liquor we can drink without getting drunk. Someday, somehow, we're going to find somebody we can drink. But someday, somehow, and that idea is so strong, it leads us back to taking the first drink. Then the allergy takes over, and then we end up drunk and sick all over again. So the real problem that we alcoholics sin is in our mind rather than in our body. Our mind thinking about what alcohol will do for us, not what it does to us. Joe? The obsession is stronger than our willpower. That's important. Page 24. I almost said squick relighting, but it's actually italic writing. The fact is that most alcohols, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into conscience with sufficient force and the memory and suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We were without defense against the first drink. In other words, I have a short, uh, wonderful memory. It's just short. See, I can't remember, remember the divorce course. I can't remember the jailhouses. I can't remember the speeding tickets or the DWIs I got. I can only remember what alcohol will do for me. I can't remember what alcohol has done to me. I have a wonderful memory. It's just short. There are almost certain consequences that follow taking even a glass of beer do not crowd into the mind to deter us. If these thoughts occur, they are hazy and readily supplanted with the old threadbare idea that this time we shall handle ourselves like other people. There is a complete failure of the kind of defense that keeps one from putting his hand on a hot stove. You know, if you put your hand on a hot stove, if you burned it pretty badly, chances are you'll always remember that. Chances are you'll never go back and put your hand on a hot stove to see if it'll burn you again. Well, that kind of defense keeps us from getting hurt over and over and over. I remember as a kid growing up in the Depression years, back in the in 1930s, and we didn't have very much in those days. Uh, we didn't have hot and cold running water. We didn't have forced air heat. Uh, if we had heat in the wintertime, we were lucky. We burned wood. We burned coal. We burned whatever we could get. Joe said in his neighborhood, they burned other people's houses from time to time. In order. But it didn't make any difference how poor it, the family is. Cleanliness is still next to godliness. And I remember as a kid growing up, we had to take a bath every Saturday night, period. Now, whether you needed a bath or not is beside the point. You still have to take one every Saturday night. And I remember one time in the middle of the winter, Mother had heated the bath water on the old heating stove in the living room, put it in a number three zinc wash tub sitting behind that stove. Now, every kid in the family takes a bath in the same water. I'm the baby of the family. By the time it got to me, the crud would be about an inch thick on it. Mother said, get in there and get yourself clean. And I thought to myself, how in the hell do I get clean in there? You didn't talk to your mother that way in those days for sure. I got in an old bathtub full of water. I began to soap myself standing there next to this red-hot heating stove. And somehow I managed to bend over and stick my rear against that hot stove. <laughs> I shall never forget it. Burned a blister on my rear end about as big as my hand. Hurt me worse than anything had ever hurt me before. And do you know I've never had an obsession of the mind to stick my ass on a hot stove since then. <laughs> You betcha, I can remember today just exactly how that felt. Never have I jerked my britches down, backed up to a stove, and said, burn me again. <laughs> now, alcohol has burned me over and over and over and over and over and over, just as bad as that stove ever burned me. And left on my own resources, I simply cannot remember what alcohol does to me. Left on my own resources, I think, start thinking about what it's going to do for me. And as I think about what it's going to do for me, it pushes out what it does to me, and I actually believe that this time it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. The complete failure of one keeping him from putting his hand on a hot stove. Now, 
the last paragraph on page 24. When this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies, he's probably placed himself beyond human aid, and unless locked up may die or go permanently insane. But if I place myself beyond human aid, the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous will not bring about recovery from alcoholism because the fellowship is made up of a bunch of people who are just as powerless over alcohol as I am. And if I'm to recover from that condition, I'm going to have to have the aid of a power greater than human power. Page 25, <coughs> there is a solution. There is a solution to this thing that's just been described in the first half of this chapter. There is a solution, and almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings, which the process requires for a successful consummation. But we saw that it really worked in others, and we had to come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life that we've been living. When therefore we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. We have found much of heaven, have been rocketed to a fourth dimension of existence, of which we had not even dreamed. Well, I like that idea of being rocketed somewhere, don't you? You know, I, I saw in the fellowship, I was going to a lot of meetings, I saw that they said that this program worked for them and caused them to not want to drink again. I had no experience with that, so I believed them. I saw it work in the fellowship. The fellowship showed me through their own experience that this program would work. But eventually they needed to talk to me and started talking to me about working these steps into my life. And certainly I didn't like that. Then I read here on page 25. The great fact is just this and nothing less, that we've had deep and effective spiritual experiences. And look what they've done for us. Which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life, toward our fellows, and toward God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered in our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us which we could never do by ourselves. In the first printing of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, that little aspect was right up there by that word spiritual experience. It says fully explained on Appendix 2. It was not in the first printing of the book. They wrote in to Bill and said, Bill, what do you mean this spiritual experience that you're talking about? We're doing the things that you did, but we're not having that great light flash of light like you did. Are we doing something wrong? So what he did in the in the next printing of the book, he put that little asterisk in there and said fully ex explained on Appendix 2. Later on, on page 27, it says for further application, see Appendix 2. And on page 47, it says, please see Appendix 2. <laughs> Bill referred to that asterisk three different times. It's important that I understand what he means by those terms. And so he won't... He, wrote back there what he meant by the term spiritual experience and spiritual awakening. Because if the writer of the book understands the meaning of those one way and we read it and understand it another way, the message that comes through will be garbled. And certainly it was in my life. Because when I was a young guy, uh, seven, eight years old, I told myself, if I ever got big enough they can't catch me, I'm not going either to church. And I got big enough they couldn't catch me and I didn't go. But at one time they did catch me, and we went to a revival meeting. And I, my Aunt Much was there, and she's as much of a woman. Why don't we call her Aunt Much? But uh, Aunt Much she got into the spirit that night. And the next thing I know, she's speaking in a strange language that I never heard of before. And then she's rolling around on that sawdust floor, screaming and hollering, jumping up and down, jumping over those pews. She was having a spiritual experience. And whenever they talk about a spiritual experience in this book, I thought that's what I was going to have to have. That's all I understood about it. And I was dreading it, to tell you the truth. But for people like me who didn't know any better, they put in the back of this book on page 569 of the third edition, 567 of the fourth edition, what they meant by those terms, spiritual awakening and spiritual experience. And it's really important that I understand what they mean by those terms when they write, because we're going to refer to it some more. So on page 569 uh, or 67, it says this, spiritual experience. The term spiritual experience and spiritual awakening are used many times in this book, which, upon careful reading, and we know that alcoholics don't do careful reading, do we? 
shows that the personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism has manifested itself among us in many different forms. Okay, I learned something already in the first chapter, or first paragraph. It might be called spiritual awakening. It might be called spiritual experience. But in either case, it will be a personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism. Our personality is made up by the way we think, by the way we feel, ideas, emotions, and attitudes, and etc. So whether it be spiritual awakening or spiritual exchange, uh, spiritual experience, it will result in the change in the personality. And it sounds like what Dr. Silfworth talked about when he called it a psychic change. So there's four terms we might see. Spiritual experience, spiritual awakening, personality change, psychic change. All mean changes in attitude. That spiritual experience is one like Bill had, which was sudden and profound. A spiritual awakening builds slowly over a period of time. But in either case, it brings about a personality change. Yet it's true that our first printing gave many readers the impression that these personality changes or religious experiences must be in the nature of sudden and spectacular upheaval. Happily for everyone, this conclusion is, a, is erroneous. Well, I'm glad to hear that. In the first few chapters, a number of sudden revolutionary changes are described. Though it is not our intention to create such an impression, many alcoholics have nevertheless concluded that in order to recover, they must acquire an immediate and overwhelming God consciousness, followed at once by a vast change in feeling and outlook. Among our rapidly growing membership of thousands of alcoholics, such transformations, though frequent, are by no means the rule. Most of our experiences are what the psychologist William James calls the educational variety, because they develop slowly over a period of time. Quite often, friends of the newcomer are aware of the difference long before he is himself. He finally realizes that he has undergone a profound alteration in his reaction to life, that such a change could hardly have been brought about by himself alone. What often takes place in a few months could seldom have been accomplished by years of self-discipline. With few exceptions, our members find that they have perhaps an unsuspected inner resource which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves. Most of us think this awareness of a power greater than ourselves is the essence of spiritual experience. Our more religious members call it God consciousness. Most emphatically, we wish to say that any alcoholic capable of honestly facing his problems in the light of our experience can recover, provided he does not close his mind to all spiritual concepts. He can only be defeated by an attitude of intolerance or belligerent denial. We find that no one, have need, no one need have difficulty with the spirituality of the program. Willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness are the essentials of recovery, but these are indispensable. There is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all argument, which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance, and that principle is contempt, prior to investigation. I knew so many things that were not true when I arrived at Alcoholics Anonymous. It was almost impossible to learn anything that was true. My mind was made up already. I needed an open mind. We've already seen once back when Bill was talking about the great ocean liner, how he liked to use things we already knew about to teach us something new. All good writers do that. Another thing that they do, most good writers repeat themselves quite often. But when they do, they usually find a different word that means basically the same thing rather than saying the same word over and over and over. And there seems to be a key word running all the way through this appendix on spiritual experience, and that's the word change. Let's look on page 569. Let's see how many times he said change and how many ways he said it. In the first paragraph, he talked about a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery. In the second paragraph, he again mentioned personality changes. But then he said in the nature of a sudden and spectacular upheaval. An upheaval is to change something entirely. In the third paragraph, he said that sudden revolutionary changes. To revolutionize something is to change it entirely. In the last sentence in the third paragraph, he talked about Immediate and overwhelming God consciousness to overwhelm something is to change it. 
In the third paragraph, last sentence, he called it a vast change in feeling and outlook. In the fourth paragraph, the first sentence, he said such transformations to transform is to change. About the middle of the fourth paragraph, he talked about a profound alteration. To alter is to change. So the key to this whole thing is to change from what we were when, when we came here to something entirely different in our minds. We come here restless, irritable, and discontented. We come here filled with shame, fear, guilt, and remorse. We come here as very selfish, self-centered human beings. Now, if we can change those old ideas and those old attitudes to something different, then maybe we can find the peace of mind necessary to be able to have good long-term sobriety. And it really doesn't make any difference what we call it. We can call it a spiritual experience. If it happens fast, you see it once in a while. We can call it spiritual awakening, which takes place over a longer period of time. Most of us have a spiritual awakening. We change as we apply, as we learn, as we work the program, the changes take place. Or we can call it a personality change or a psychic change. And the only people I ever see fail at this thing are those that refuse to change. And if they refuse to change, they're going to stay just exactly the way they are, even though they're in the fellowship. And sooner or later, life's going to become unbearable, and they end up going back to drinking. So our real solution to alcoholism is a spiritual experience or spiritual awakening. One's fast, one slow. I like this idea about changing, and I'm like most people in AA that I know. I stood in the back of the room, and I heard it when they talk about changing. I didn't want to be who I was. I looked down at my feet, and I was ashamed. I wanted to be something different. And the type of change I thought they were talking about was for me to be something that I wasn't. So I set about to find me some heroes in Alcoholics Anonymous. And we all need our heroes. At least I did. Still do. Charlie was one of my heroes. Now, I emulated Charlie. I tried to be just like Charlie. I almost made it. Thank God I didn't. <laughs> no. I love Charlie. He's my sponsor today. But what I'm trying to say is that I wanted to change to be like somebody else. And I think the type of change they're talking about today that I understand it is to change from what I have become to that which God intends for me to be. Just me. And that's a marvelous experience in life to someday just be who you are no matter what that is and be glad about it. And I'm certainly glad about being me today. Thank God for that. Now let's go back to page 25 now for just a few minutes. He said, if you're as seriously alcoholic as we were. Last paragraph on 25. We believe there's no middle of the road solution. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. We had passed into a region in which there's no return through human aid. We had but two alternatives, and here they are. One was to go into the bitter end, blotting out the conscience of our intolerable situation as best we could. That's step one. And the other to accept spiritual help. And that's step two. He said this... We did because we honestly wanted to and we're willing to make the effort. Seems as though we alcoholics only have one or two choices. We can stay powerless over alcohol, end up drinking until we die from alcoholism, or we can accept spiritual help. And there doesn't seem to be any other choices for us. Now, I hear a lot of people in AA today say, you better not talk too much about God or you're going to run the newcomer off. But if you'll notice here in the big book, it doesn't mind talking about God at all. He finally gets around to telling us we just got one or two choices. We can stay powerless and drink till we die, or we can accept spiritual help. And we don't seem to have any other choice. My old sponsor straightened me out in this area years ago. He said, Charlie, you don't need to worry about running a newcomer off talking about God. He said, if you do, whiskey will put him right back in here. But he has no other place to go. And if he lives, he'll be back. And then he'll start talking about God when he comes back the next time. And you know, I found that to be true in my own case, as well as in many other cases too. Now you would think that this idea of the vital spiritual experience, this need for the power greater than human power, 
this idea that Abbey brought to Bill from the Oxford roots, you would think that that would have come from somebody in religion. And it always blows my mind to see where this idea really did come. Let's let's look at this next example, and then we'll be through for the night, Joe. Yeah. We may run over just a few minutes, but we'll get through it here. He said, a certain American businessman, which was Roland Hazard, remember, he's the one who carried the message to every Navy brought it to Bill. A certain American businessman had ability, good sense, and high character. For years, he had floundered from one sanitarium to another. He'd consulted the very best-known American psychiatrist. Then he'd gone to Europe, placing himself in the care of the celebrated physician, the psychiatrist, Dr. Yoon, who prescribed for him. Though experience had made him skeptical, he finished his treatment with unusual confidence. His physical and mental condition was unusually good. Above all, he had believed he had acquired such a profound knowledge of the inner workings of his mind and his hidden springs that relapse was unthinkable. Nevertheless, he was drunk in a short time. More baffling still, he had given himself no satisfactory explanation for his fall. Now, Roland went to Dr. Yoon, who was over in Switzerland, one of the world's best-known psychiatrists, and he didn't go there for a 28-day treatment program. He was with Dr. Yoon for a full year. They had a session every week for a full year. And when Roland left there, he thought to go back to drinking again would be impossible for him to do. He had learned so much about himself through Dr. Yoon, about his mind and everything, that he'd never have to drink again. But we also know that Roland got drunk in a very short period of time after leaving there. Then he goes back to Dr. Yoon. He left after one year, headed for the ship to come home, and got drunk on the way to the ship. So he said, so he returned to this doctor whom he admired, and he asked him point blank why he could not recover. He wished above all things to regain self-control. He seemed quite rational and well-balanced with respect to other problems, yet he had no control whatever over alcohol. Why was this? He begged the doctor to tell him the whole truth, and he got it. In the doctor's judgment, he was utterly hopeless. He could never regain his position in society, and he would have to place himself under lock and key or hire a bodyguard if he expected to live long. But this was a great physician's opinion. You know, that's got to be a pretty low blow for a guy like Roland. Been over there for a year. And we, we think about Dr. Yoon here. He was a very humble man, evidently, because he could have said to Roland, look, you're an alcoholic, you've got plenty of money, you keep coming back and we'll continue to treat you. We'll say that you have a volume deficiency or something. But he didn't do that. What he did was he said, Roland, I have done all that I can possibly do for you. Psychiatry has done all it can possibly do for you. You can't. You have to hire a bodyguard or be locked up because I can't do nothing more for you. That was a great physician's opinion. Now, some of our alcoholic readers may think they can do without spiritual help. Let us tell you the rest of the conversation our friend had with his doctor. The doctor said, you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. I've never seen one single case recover where that state of mind existed to the extent that it does in you. Our friend felt as though the gates of hell had closed on him with a clang. He said to the doctor, is there no exception? Yes, replied the doctor, there is. Exceptions to cases such as yours have been occurring since early times. Here and there. Once in a while, alcoholics have had what are called vital spiritual experiences. To me, these occurrences are phenomena. They appear to be in the nature of huge emotional displacements and rearrangements. Change. <clears throat> Ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which were once the guiding forces of the lives of these men, are suddenly cast to one side. Change. And a completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. Change. In fact, I've been trying to produce some such emotional rearrangement within you. Change. With many individuals, the methods which I employed are successful, but I've never been successful with an alcoholic of your description. Asterisk, bottom of the page, for amplification, see Appendix 2. Blows my mind when I read this thing. You know, this guy, there was three leading psychiatrists in the world in those days. It was Dr. Freud. It was Dr. Adler, and it was Dr. Yoon. Adler and Yoon were both students of Freud. And Dr. Yoon had fallen out 
with Freud and Adler on one thing and one thing only. Freud and Adler thought all problems would be solved through the mind. And Dr. Jung thought maybe, maybe, some had to be solved through spirituality, that there wasn't any particular answer in the mind. You know, thank God that Roland got to Dr. Jung. If he'd gotten to Freud or Adler, we'd be sitting around in meetings trying to psychoanalyze ourselves today. <laughs> which unfortunately many of us are trying to do that. But just think about the humility of this doctor. Enough humility to say to Roland, Roland, I can't help you anymore. With all my knowledge of the mind and all my skills, I've done all I can do for you. You're going to die from alcoholism. And he says, is there no exception to that? And this little doctor was great enough to reach out of his own field and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once in a while, I've seen people like you have vital spiritual experiences. He said, to me, they're phenomenal. I don't understand them. But they seem to be in the nature of huge emotional displacements and rearrangements, changes, changes, changes. And as I look at this thing, I really, I really begin to see how lucky we really are. I begin to see how God surely put this thing together for people like us. You know, our step one came from a non-alcoholic doctor in New York City called Dr. Silkworth. Our step two came from a non-alcoholic psychiatrist over in Switzerland named Dr. Yoon. Our last ten steps came from a group of people who were non-alcoholic practicing first century Christianity. They all came from somebody other than us. And Bill always said that his mind was used as a vessel. He said, I knew none of these things. And all these diverse ideas gelled together in my head, and I was able to write the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? I think it would do us well to remember that, too, <laughs> that they really came from people other than us. Now, one thing we got to do, let's look at a little picture real fast. And then we're done for the night. For those that are of us that are powerless, and that's all of us, the answer lies within power. And this little picture kind of illustrates what we've been talking about in chapter two. On the left hand side of the sheet we see the fellowship that supports us. The newcomer comes in. And the older members through sharing their experience, strength, and hope for the newcomer provides enough support for the newcomer to be able to stay sober for a period of time. And by the way, it's a two-way street. As the older member supports the new member, the older member draws strength and support from that also. Lots of power in the fellowship, no doubt about that. It would be almost impossible to be in AA very long today and not begin to believe there must be a power greater than human power working within and throughout this fellowship. When you hear countless hundreds of people saying it's only by the grace of God, or because of a power greater than I am, or because of God as I understand him, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink in X number of days, weeks, months, or years. You can hardly hear that over and over and over and over and not begin to believe there must be some power greater than human power working within this thing. The instant the newcomer begins to believe that, then that opens the mind and he becomes willing to investigate. And upon investigation, with the help of a good sponsor, they find the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at their feet, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And as they begin to apply those steps in their lives and take the actions called for, then they have a spiritual experience or a spiritual awakening. And it revolutionizes our entire ideas, emotions, and attitudes. Everything that goes within the mind, they have a psychic change or a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. Now, when the newcomer has had that change, then they now become an older member of AA. And they can go back on the left-hand side of the sheet, and they can support the next newcomer come in. 
and the next newcomer comes to believe, and then they can help them with the steps so the next one can have a spiritual experience also. And if you'll notice, we're basing older membership not on how long you've been sober, but upon the quality of that sobriety. You can't give something away that you don't have yourself. And if we haven't had the spiritual awakening through the program of action, then we can't give that to somebody else, and we can't help somebody else have it either. You know, there was a time in AA when there was no, no, no question about this. Every newcomer was expected to work the program with the help of a sponsor, and they were expected to have the spiritual experience or spiritual awakening. And if the newcomer didn't want to do that, well, nobody argued with them. They just said, well, you might as well leave. So there's nothing we can do to help you unless you're willing to undergo these changes. Now, somewhere down the line, though, we begin to water our program down. And as we begin to water our program down, we went from a life-changing program to a non-drinking program. And then we had to start measuring success by how long have you been sober rather than by the quality of that sobriety. And as I look around AA today, I see all kinds of people in AA. You know, I see, I see guys come in here, men and women. They get a good sponsor. They get right into the program. And within a matter of months, they're an entirely different human being. My God, you just love to be around them. They're always laughing and cutting up and having fun. They're always trying to help AA and trying to help other alcoholics. They are a real delight, delight to behold. They really are. You see other people in AA that's been in here 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years. They treated it like a cafeteria. They took what they wanted. They left what they wanted. Now, they're better off than they were when they first came here, but you never know what kind of shape they're going to be in the next time you run into them. One day they're up, and the next day they're down, and they're kind of like a yo-yo going back and forth, back and forth. And then sometimes you see those that have been in here 15, 16, 18, 20 years. Never worked the step. Damn proud of it. <laughs> and they're the ones that say, if you want what we've got, and you're willing to go to any damn lady. Now, some of those guys, you'd like to buy them a drink. You know damn good and well they would feel better if they had a drink. So, so we're not talking about length of sobriety. We're talking about quality of sobriety. And the quality comes about through the real solution, the vital spiritual experience, the spiritual awakening. So we got two powers. The power of the fellowship that supports us, the power of the common solution which changes us. And those two powers added together will overcome our powerlessness over alcohol. Thank you all for being here tonight. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Nine o'clock in the morning. We probably uh, probably ought to close with the Lord's Prayer, I imagine. Okay. okay. Yeah. My name is Charlie Farmland. I'm a very grateful recovering alcoholic. Okay. Because I'm a member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and by the grace of the power that I found through the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't found necessary to take a drink for 12,014 days today, one day at a time, and for this I'm very grateful. Hey, you guys look great this morning. Isn't it great to be alive on a, on a Friday morning and know where you are? Yay! Isn't it great to be alive on Friday morning and know where your car is? Isn't it great to be alive on Friday morning and know who you slept with last night, if anybody? Some of the, some of the side benefits of staying sober. Uh, before we start into our regular program, I've been asked uh, by some people to, uh, to tell you about our little trust fund thing, the drawing that we're having for the big book and the dust jackets. Uh, it seemed as though several years ago there were some people up in Akron, Ohio, went by Dr. Bob's house to take a look at it, and there was beer cans in the front. One, my name is Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and it's truly by God's grace and the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and the Program of Alcoholics Anonymous 
that I found in a book called Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm sober this morning, and for that I'm very, very thankful. And I've been sober ever since I quit drinking. <laughs> and for that I am truly grateful, and so are a lot of other people. I, I would like to read the preamble to you this morning. Alcoholic, this, my, my sponsor calls this the purpose. We don't ever want to forget our purpose. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. It does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and to help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Thank you. Okay, yesterday and last night, we spent a lot of time on the doctor's opinion and Bill's story in and, and Chapter 2. I'd normally see Bill as he's writing the book, kind of sitting back from time to time and reviewing what he's done up to this point. Probably able to say to himself, well, I was able to show them the problem in the doctor's opinion, in my story, Bill's story. I was able to show them a solution in Chapter 2. Then he probably says to himself, they're not going to like that solution that I showed them in chapter 2 any better than I did. Remember how Bill had an aversion to those things of the, of the religious nature, old ideas and old prejudices. Gave him a hard time when it came to believe in a power greater than himself that could restore him to sanity. I think he probably says to himself, I think what I better do now, since they're not going to like that solution any more than I did, I think maybe I better show them what's going to happen to them if they don't find that solution. And he sits down and he starts writing another chapter, chapter 3, called More About Alcoholism. In this chapter, More About Alcoholism, we talk about one thing and one thing only. We talk about the insanity of alcoholism. You know, if step 2 said we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, well, if we need to be restored to sanity, that indicates that we must be insane. And many AA members are highly offended when you bring that idea up. And they say, oh, no, 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 don't tell me I'm insane. Oh, yeah, I do some crazy, stupid things when I'm drinking. But when I'm sober, I'm much like other people. Other AA members say, well, I don't have any trouble with that insanity because I remember all those crazy, stupid things I did while drunk. In both cases, they're referring to insanity uh, as the things that we do while drinking as the insanity of alcoholism. No, that's not insanity. Those things that we do, those crazy, stupid things we do while drinking, that's caused by alcohol. Alcohol enters the mind. It lowers the inhibitions. And if your inhibitions have been lowered by alcohol, look out. You're going to do some pretty crazy, stupid things all right. But that's caused by alcohol itself. And in order for us to be able to finally, finally be able to see and understand the insanity that we're really talking about, again, we had to go back to the dictionary. And when we went back to the dictionary and we looked up the word sane or sanity. And the word sane or sanity is defined as wholeness of mind or completeness of mind. A mind that is whole, a mind that is complete, is a mind that is considered to be sane. And if your mind is whole, if your mind is complete, you can usually see the truth about everything around you. You make decisions based on truth, and life usually turns out pretty good. Now, an insane mind is simply one that is less than whole. And if our mind is less than whole, that means we could not always see the truth. And we'll make decisions based upon a lie, and life usually turns out to be an absolute living hell based on those circumstances. To be insane does not mean that you're crazy. A lot of people get insanity and craziness mixed up. If you're crazy, that means you've lost more than half your marbles. And you've got to be locked up somewhere to protect you and society from you. But to be insane does not mean that you're crazy. You know, it simply means that you're 
less than whole. And it seems as though from time to time we alcoholics are less than whole when it comes to alcohol. We can't always see the truth about it. We make a decision based upon a lie, and then we run into the truth, which of course is extreme drunkenness over and over and over again. So all this chapter does here that more about alcoholism through a series of examples. It talks about the man of 30. It talks about a fellow named Jim. It talks about the jaywalker. It talks about a fellow named Fred. And in each case, we're going to look into the mind just before we take the first drink. Can we or can we not see the truth about alcohol? If we can see the truth, we're sane. If we can't see the truth, we're considered to be insane. And you remember Abby brought Bill a solution, and Bill was aghast at that solution. Well, Bill just presented us with a solution in the previous chapter. He knew that some of us were going to be aghast at that solution, too. And so he's going to tell us a little bit more about alcoholism, a little bit more of what might happen to us unless we accept the solution that he described. This chapter on page 30 is called More About Alcoholism. It could be called More Truth About Alcoholism because I need to see the truth about my condition. I didn't know exactly what it is because when I first got here, I thought it was a moral issue. Turns out it's an illness. But I need to see some more truth about the illness of alcoholism. And you see, I always do better when I know better. You know, and I've heard all my life, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. But if we don't know the truth, then we're not free. So this chapter, we have, uh, this chapter, more, tr more about alcoholism, is to help us to see more truth so that we can understand our condition. So let's go to page 30. It said, most of us have been unwilling to admit that we were real alcoholics. No person likes to think that he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it's not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove that we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we're like other people who presently may be has to be smashed. You have to be real careful here. We see Bill again doing one of his favorite things. He's repeating himself over and over but he's using a different word each time he does so. He's going to use four different words in these two paragraphs that Joe just read that all mean the same thing. And if you can see what he's doing, it makes sense. If you don't, it kind of confuses you. He said the idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. And we talked about an obsession already. Remember, an obsession is an idea that overcomes all ideas to the contrary. It's an idea that is so strong that it can make you believe something that isn't true, make you believe a lie. The great obsession of every abnormal drinker. He said the persistence of this illusion is astonishing. We all know what an illusionist is. An illusionist is a magician. And they can stand in front of you, and with a sleight of hand and a few props, they can make you believe something that is not true. So an illusion also means to believe a lie. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. Insanity is simply to be unable to see the truth. Insanity doesn't mean you're all gone. It just means you're not quite all here. And when it comes to alcohol, we have a form of insanity. We can't always see the truth about it. The next paragraph, he said, we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people or present be has to be smashed. The word delusion means the same thing. If you've deluded yourself, it means you've come to believe something that is not true. So we may see any one of four different words, all meaning the same thing. Obsession illusion, insanity, or delusion, all meaning to believe a lie, to believe something that is not true. 
Now let's go see the lie that we alcoholics believe. Let's see the illusion, the delusion, the insanity, the obsession of the mind of we alcoholics just before we take a drink. Now remember, just before we take a drink, we are stone cold sober. No alcohol in the system whatsoever. Let's go to page 32, second paragraph. So the man of 30 was doing a great deal of speed drinking. He was very nervous in the morning after these bouts and quieted himself with more liquor. He was ambitious to succeed in business, but saw that he would get nowhere if he drank at all. Once he started, he had no control whatever. Now, he made up his mind that until he'd been successful in business and had re retired, he would not touch another drop. An exceptional man. He remained bone dry for 25 years and retired at the age of 55 after a successful and happy business career. Then he fell victim to a belief, which practically every alcoholic has, that his long period of sobriety and self-discipline had qualified him to drink as other men. Out came his carpet slippers in a bottle. In two months, he was in the hospital, puzzled and humiliated. He tried to regulate his drinking for a while, making several trips to the hospital meantime. Then, gathering all his forces, he attempted to stop all together and found he could not. Every means of solving his problem which money could buy was at his disposal. Every attempt failed. Though a robust man of retirement, he went to pieces quickly and was dead within four years. Now, this case contains a powerful lesson. Most of us have believed that if we remain sober for a long stretch, we could there after drink normally. But here's a man at 55 years now. He's just where he left off at 30. We've seen the truth demonstrated again and again. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. To mention the drink after a period of sobriety were in a short time as bad as ever. Now, if we're planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservations of any kind, nor any lurking notion that someday we'll be immune to alcohol. Said earlier, we had to concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. That don't mean I agree with that statement. What that means is that I fought one heck of a battle, and I lost. Alcohol beat me up. That's what conceding means. I have surrendered to the idea that I can't drink. But this fellow here hadn't had that concession yet. And so he drank again. And we know the truth to be this. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. We've never seen one single case where one of us has ever been able to go back to successful drinking. Every time we try, it just simply gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So the truth is once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Now believe, to believe anything different than that is to believe something that is not true or to believe a lie. Now, is this guy's real problem, the fact that he has a physical allergy to alcohol, or that he has a form of insanity that tells him it's okay to drink alcohol after 25 years of sobriety? Now, based on the lie, the illusion, the delusion, he took a drink, triggered the allergy, couldn't stop drinking, and within four years, he's dead. So his real problem is not the fact that he's physically allergic to alcohol. His real problem is the fact that he has a form of insanity that tells him it's okay to drink alcohol after 25 years of sobriety. And the book is going to point this out over and over and over, that the real problem of we alcoholics centers in the mind rather than the body. Centers in the mind telling us we can drink when it's obvious that we can't. This man of 30 is a good example of the insanity of alcoholism. Once a cucumber becomes a pickle, then there'll be a cucumber again. <laughs> Once we were alcoholics cross over that line in alcoholism, we'll never be social drinkers again either. That's the old truth behind this. Okay, let's go to page 34, second paragraph. For those who are unable to drink moderately, the question of how to stop altogether is how to stop altogether. We're assuming, of course, that the reader desires to stop. Whether, per whether such a person can quit upon a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent to which he's already lost the power to choose whether he'll drink or not. Many of us felt that we had plenty of character. There was a tremendous urge to cease forever, yet we found it impossible. This is the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it. This utter inability to leave it alone, no matter how great the necessity or the wish. How then shall shall we help our readers to determine 
to their own satisfaction whether they're one of us. The experiment of quitting for a period of time will be helpful, but we think we can render an even greater service to alcoholic leaders, alcoholic sufferers, and perhaps to the medical fraternity. So we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking, for obviously this is the crux of the problem. What sort of thinking dominates an alcoholic who repeats time after time the desperate experiment of the first drink? Friends who reasoned with him after his spree, which had brought him to the point of divorce or bankruptcy, are mystified when he walks directly into the saloon. Why does he, or what is he thinking? Okay, they're going to give us an example now of a fellow called Jim. Now, Joe just loves old Jim. He gets a little screwed up with him once in a while. Let's, let's take a look at Jim's story, and let's look into Jim's mind. Just before he takes the first drink, Let's see if he believed the lie, if he had a form of insanity. Joe? Everybody likes Jim, and I do too. <clears throat> Our first example is a friend we shall call Jim. This man has a charming wife and family. He inherited a lucrative automobile agency. He had a commendable World War record, and he's a good salesman. Everybody likes him. Typical alcoholic, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Certainly is. Now, he's an intelligent man and normal so far as we can see, or except for a nervous disposition. Now, he did no drinking until he was 35. In a few years, he became so violent when intoxicated that he had to be committed. On leaving the treatment center, excuse me, on leaving the asylum, excuse me, same thing. On leaving the asylum, he came into contact with us. Now, we told him what we knew of alcoholism. They told him about step one, the powerless condition of the mind under the body. And the answer we had found. They told him about step two the power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And he made a beginning. Later on, the big book's going to say that, that step three is but a beginning. So apparently, Jim took step one, two, and three. Now, almost immediately, after taking one, two, and three, sure enough, things starts getting better. His family was reassembled and began to work as a salesman for a business he'd lost through drinking. And all went well for a time, but he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. A little later on, we're going to find out the only way you enlarge on step three is through four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Jim didn't do any of those. He just did one, two, and three. To his consternation, he found himself drunk a half a dozen times in rapid succession. On each of these occasions we worked with him, we learned carefully what had happened. Now, these were good alcoholics. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.